name is Alicia Stanley and I serve as director of off-campus study at Grinnell College. This year, I've been a member of the selection committee for the Award for Academic Achievement Abroad, and I'm honored to introduce our second award recipient, Taylor Gardner. Taylor is a fourth year student at Elon University, majoring in international and global studies with concentrations in Latin America and the Middle East. She studied abroad on CIEE's liberal arts program in Buenos Aires, Argentina in fall 2018. She then obtained permission from Elon to pursue Arabic in Nablus in the West Bank in the summer of 2019. In both locations, Taylor conducted research on women's experiences with and memories of political violence and how previous generations of women's struggles inform present activism. In his nomination letter, Dr. Sandy Marshall remarked, the results of Taylor's work have proven to be illuminating to multiple constituencies from the multiple scholars and various academic fields she has consulted, to the different generations of women in universities, homes, and community centers with whom she has conducted this research. Having gotten to know her a bit during these past few months, I believe her continued scholarly work will influence future generations as well. Please join me in welcoming Taylor to present her research project. Hi everyone, my name is Taylor Garner and I'm a senior at Elon University. My undergraduate research investigates women's intergenerational memories during times of political violence in Argentina and Palestine. Before I even get into what that means, I first want to give a little bit of background about my academic studies and what led me to this topic. As Alicia said, I'm an international and global studies major, and I concentrate specifically in Latin America and the Middle East. So for this research, I really wanted to choose a topic that would allow me to combine both of these concentrations. I didn't choose Argentina or Palestine because they are comparable by any margin, culturally, politically, or historically, but I wanted to understand how women from these two very different countries talk about state violence. And what I learned after a little bit of uh, literature review was that women from these countries were actually largely excluded from national narratives of the state violence. So I became very inspired to travel to these countries and illuminate the women's stories that I believe were going largely untold. This is what led me to study abroad in Buenos Aires, Argentina in the fall of 2018 with CIEE's liberal arts program. And then I later conducted research in Nablus, Palestine with the support of Elon University in the, in the summer of 2019. I narrowed down my investigation to women's memories of violence during the, or during the dictatorship in Argentina from 1976 until 1983 and the occupation in Palestine from 1967 to the present day. My research questions included, what are the different ways that women experience violence? How do different generations of women keep and pass down memories of violence? Do these memories mobilize women socially, politically, and if so, how? And then what can we learn by putting these two very different contexts in conversation with each other? Between Argentina and Palestine, I interviewed over 30 women about their experiences during the dictatorship and the occupation. The interviews were conducted in Spanish in Argentina and then interchangeably in Arabic and English when I was in Palestine. I found pr participants through immersing myself in the local community. In Argentina, I lived with a host family. That's my host sister, Kata, up there with our dog, Poncho. And I took classes at La Universidad de Buenos Aires. This picture is funny because it's actually of a class that was held outside in the streets during one of the teacher strikes. I also took yoga classes in the local community, volunteered with a local English conversation club, and engaged with organizations and NGOs all around the city. That's a picture of the Museum of Mem Memory, which was used as a home to a clandestine torture center during the dictatorship, but is now a museum in order to talk about what happened during the dictatorship and help advocate for peace. In Palestine, my experience was very much the same. So I lived with local university students while, while I was taking classes at an University. I took Arabic classes there. And then I also volunteered with a, local, um, with a local community center called Project Hope, where I taught English and yoga, in which I became connected with multiple women's NGOs around the city. That top picture up there is actually a picture of my volunteer cohort and then the picture to the right is of a wedding that I was invited to by my translator that I had for these yoga classes that I was teaching. And that was very much my experience in both countries was that I not only was able to find participants through immersing myself in the local culture, but also develop relationships with this diverse spectrum of people. 
So what I did with my research was that I conducted semi-structured interviews that took place in homes, coffee shops, museums, and universities. Given the sensitive nature of my research, I prioritized the comfort of my participants. I often sat with my interviewees for hours talking about tango, for example, in Argentina, or in Palestine, I'd always have to take part in the uncompromising ritual of tea sharing before actually getting down to the interviews themselves. But what I found was that this process actually gave me invaluable trust from my participants. In fact, in one instance in Palestine, I'd planned to go over to a friend's house to have lunch with her family and then interview one of her neighbors. But of course, the lunch ended up lasting about five hours. And then by the time that was over, I finally got to interview the neighbor. And afterwards, I was, um, they insisted that I stay for dinner. And then after that, they insisted that it was too late for me to go home, so I had to stay over for the night. And that was very much my experience in both countries. It was more than just, you know, the research and the data collection for me. It was actually about creating and cultivating these deep relationships that I still manage today. After 32 interviews, what I found was that when the dictatorship and occupation began in Argentina and Palestine, women were at the forefront and resisting this violence in order to protect their families. This is interesting because women in both of these societies were traditionally confined to roles within the household and in, and in private spaces. So when this violence happened that you see them start to push outside of these private spaces into the public sphere and become more visible. They also began forming organizations such as Las Madres de la Plaza de Mayo, which is seen there on the left, which protested the dictatorship and shed light on the 30,000 disappeared people or los desaparecidos, who were kidnapped, tortured, and killed by the military government. In Palestine, it was very similar in that the Coalition of Women for Peace began protesting the occupation during the Second Intifada, which was one of the battles that occurred, and advocates still today for a more um, just, just society. Then I found that as women began to mobilize this nationalist agenda, they realized that they could also start pushing for their own rights. Women's organizations and individual advocates in both countries continue to form and advance new women's movements. Today, there are organizations such as Ni Una Menos, or Not One Woman Less, which advocates against the femicide that plagues much of the country and Latin America as a whole. When I was in Argentina, I also got to take part in some of the peaceful protests that were occurring during the vote on abortion. In Palestine, it was very similar in that women's NGOs have recently helped change the divorce laws so that, there are more so that there is, they are more equitable between men and women. Also, just days before one of my interviews, I found out that the Prime Minister of Palestine changed the minimum age for marriage in order to protect young females from potentially abusive relationships. However, my findings show that women in Palestine have been pushed back into their private sphere of the home and confined within small NGOs and no longer play a role in this mass political mobilization that we still see today in Argentina. I argue that this is because the conflict is still ongoing in Palestine. So the women's movements there and the advocacy that you see is actually overshadowed by this larger nationalist struggle that is still ongoing. One of my participants, Abia in Palestine, shed light on this and said that we have to struggle against the occupation while also liberating ourselves. So there's a sense of double oppression that is still ongoing there. Nonetheless, women in both Argentina and Palestine have mobilized their memories of this past violence to achieve lasting female liberties and continue to fight for equality today. Not only does this research demonstrate that women become activists in society during periods of state violence, but they pass on their memories and use education as a motor of change. Elisa, a tour guide at the Museum of, Mem of Memory in Argentina said, we talk about the dictatorship to remember and never forget. Never forget or nunca mas is a phrase that emanates throughout Argentinian society and is a reminder to always fight for justice and never repeat the past. This is really interesting because a similar type of, em of embodied memory lives in Palestine through the stories that women from the older generations tell the younger ones. One of my participants, Saba, said, here in the refugee camps in Palestine, when you ask the children where, they're, they, where they are from, they will say that they are from Akko, Ashdod, or Jaffa. These are cities that are actually on the coast in Israeli-occupied territory, because that's what they teach them growing up, where they are originally from so that they do not forget. Even if a child has never stepped foot in these cities that are now considered Israeli territory, their parents have instilled with them a deep connection to the land and their origins. Saba said, they have accents from Jaffa, even if they've never been there. 
So as you can see, older generations in both Argentina, Argentina and Palestine use never forgetting to teach their children about past violence so that they can build more peaceful futures. In fact, a common narrative that I found between Argentina and Palestine was this, des this desire to pass on memories of violence in order to mobilize a more peaceful future. Peace was a subject that came up in almost every one of the 32 interviews that I conducted. Women of every generation simply wanted a peaceful future for their families. Even in Palestine, where giving up the fight can mean losing a homeland in the erasure of a people, women wanted stability and a sense of reconciliation. One of my participants in Argentina, a young woman at the University of Cordoba, still has a letter that her grandmother or her grandfather wrote before he was abducted and assassinated by the dictatorship. The letter urged his family not to fight for vengeance, but to keep working towards justice and a more peaceful future. Her grandfather's letter mobilizes her today to persevere for human rights. Then, when I asked Abia from Palestine what message she would pass on to um, the younger generations, she said that she wanted them to keep fighting or keep struggling for rights, for a space to live in dignity and equality, to build together a regime of justice and democracy. I was raised on these ideals. I want a more beautiful future. To conclude, although many of my findings were unique to Argentinian and Palestinian context, I came across an incredible transnational connection that I'd like to share. In Palestine, I was interviewing an older woman who told me that when she was in prison during the first Intifada, she and other women there would read about Las Madres de la Plaza de Mayo in Argentina. She said that those women gave them hope and encouraged them to keep resisting. Six months earlier, when I was interviewing an older woman in Argentina, she said that she looked towards the women's movements in the United States for inspiration. We talk a lot about women supporting women, but my research shows that there's a larger picture of international solidarity. All women face oppression, but when you speak out, when you mobilize, you're not only creating a space for yourself, but for others to feel emboldened and fight for a better future. I'm so thankful for the opportunities that I was afforded with my research. I wanna thank my mentor, Dr. Sandy Marshall, who supported me from thousands of miles away when I was in Argentina and welcomed me into his incredible community in Nablus, Palestine. I'd also like to thank Elon University, especially Dr. Vandermoss Peeler and the faculty at the Global Engagement Center, who not only supported this um, nomination, but made my research in Argentina and Palestine a possibility. And finally, I'd like to thank my parents for not freaking out when I said that I wanted to live in the West Bank for a summer. Studying abroad has deeply changed and complicated my own perspectives. It has also given me the opportunity to meet some of the most inspirational, courageous women who I still talk to every day. Because of my experience abroad, I can say that I feel comfortable being uncomfortable. If you're ever contemplating going abroad, do it. But remember, it's okay to have bad days. It's okay to feel challenged. In fact, it's better that you do. And I promise that you'll come back a better, stronger person because of it.